Welcome back to the show. Today we are discussing Canada's relationship with Israel with former chair of the Canada-Israel Interparliamentary Friendship Group, Dr. James Lunny. There's still controversy swirling around this little state that dominates the world news. You tell me anything that you say is apartheid about the state of Israel, and I'll explain to you why it isn't. And these young people, sadly, on campus are just misinformed, following a, a strategy that is not based on reality. Israel, for example, in the election that just took place, uh, and they're trying to resolve, there were 13 Arab members elected, the highest number ever. And now Israeli Arabs are wanting to defend their country as well. The geopolitical situation for Israel around the world is very serious right now with Iran. Uh, threatening to destroy Israel. Demonizing these people is simply not acceptable. It never ends well when we demonize people. The delegitimization of the state itself, double standards. Why is Israel so demonized? What's your take on that? One of the things is Israel's been such a success, and they always are, and whenever economies fail anywhere in the world, it seems the Jewish people always get blamed. The uh, Nobel Prizes and the technology and the mathematics and the chemistry, the Intel uh, chip, the uh, USB sticks that we use all come out of Israel, along with agricultural technologies for arid lands and so on. It's amazing. There's a purpose for this little nation. Canada, Israel, and the world. Over the years, Canada's relationship with Israel and foreign affairs surrounding her has been a mixed bag. On a positive note, here are a few excerpts from a speech by Stephen Harper at the Israeli Knesset. He was the most recent prime minister to speak there, and he said these words. The friendship between us is rooted in history, nourished by shared values, and it is intentionally reinforced at the highest levels of commerce and government as an outward expression of strongly held inner convictions. Canada has consistently chosen, often at a great cost to us, to stand with others who oppose injustice and to confront the dark forces of the world. Just as we unequivocally support Israel's right of self-defense, so too Canada has long supported a just and secure future for the Palestinian people. I believe we share with Israel a sincere hope that the Palestinian people and their leaders will choose a viable, democratic Palestinian state committed to living peacefully alongside the Jewish state of Israel. I would argue support today for the Jewish state of Israel is more than a moral imperative. Israel is the only country in the Middle East which has long anchored itself in the ideals of freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. These are not mere notions. They are things that over time and against all odds have proven to be the only ground in which human rights, political stability, and economic prosperity may flourish. The wider they are spread, the stronger they grow. Likewise, when they are threatened anywhere, they are threatened everywhere. It is a Canadian tradition to stand for what is principled and just, regardless of whether it is convenient or popular. Canada supports Israel because it is right to do so. These words were spoken by Prime Minister Harper January 2014. Canada's history with the Jewish people has not always been so kind, though. In the 1930s, we refused Jewish refugees seeking safety on our shores, only to send many of them back to their death at the hands of Hitler. Today, within our own borders, the Jewish Canadian community has consistently had the highest number of reported hate crimes against it. There is much work to be done in combating anti-Semitism and racial divides. And Canada has a role to play within our own borders and abroad, there is no doubt. Well, my guest today knows this very well. Dr. James Lunny was an elected member of Parliament for 15 years and during that time served as the chair of the Canada-Israel Interparliamentary Friendship Group. He has long been a voice for freedom and democracy and he's with us today to give insight on Canada's relationship with Israel yesterday, today, and going forward. So let's get to it. Mr. Speaker, today Israel is celebrating 65 years as a modern independent state in an historic homeland dating back 3,000 years. It was well stated by the late Margaret Thatcher, the political and economic construction of Israel against huge odds and bitter adversaries is one of the heroic sagas of our time. Out of the ashes of the Holocaust, Israel emerged a reminder that the darkest night must yield to a new dawn. 65 years later, Israel is renowned for its contributions to science, medicine, technology, and agriculture. Excellence in innovation has earned it the reputation as the startup nation. Today, Canada stands with Israel. I hope all members will join me in saying to Israel, Happy birthday, Hag Sameach, Am Israel Chai. 
Well, Dr. Lunny, thank you so much for being back with me to talk about Canada's relationship with Israel. And, you know, I want to zero in on the intro. I, uh, you know, spewed off a few quotes from Prime Minister Stephen Harper in a famous speech that he did uh, at the Knesset, but you were there in that moment. Uh, tell us about it and your um, take on Canada's relationship with Israel. Well, that whole trip was really one of the highlights of my 15 years in Parliament, but, and I haven't been many times to Israel, but... Uh, you know, it was the the plane trip over was really celebratory. It was uh, the mix of people on the plane because you had uh, Jewish people of many stripes, you had Christian leaders of different stripes, you had the media on the plane, you had RCMP security. So there were people trying to sleep during the night on the flight over. There were others uh, wanting to pray because they were on Jerusalem time, and others had never seen uh, Jewish people with their talit and phylacteries on, uh, wanting to pray on Jerusalem time. And uh, you know, it was, it was just uh, amazing. And because of the mix of people, uh, you know, there were just conversations going on through the night. But, but in the, uh, the reception in Israel was amazing. I think it was the largest delegation that Israel had ever received. And I know the protocol, people were really stressed and I, uh, because, because usually these things are very tightly scripted. And uh, it, managing 300 people, it was really something. But I remember one of them saying to me that whatever the Canadians want, just give it to them. Oh, wow. <laughs> we'll take that. Hey, that's great. Um, so let's talk about Canada's relationship with Israel. Uh, how important is it in your viewpoint? Uh, it's extremely important. This little nation is now 71 years old, you know, just past the 70-year landmark last year. 71 this year, will be 72 next year. And, you know, uh, against all odds, uh, as was foretold by prophets, millennia ago, uh, the Jewish people were gathered to the land. It's still surrounded by controversy and maybe we need to talk about the geopolitical situation and certainly election going on and where they're at right now things we hope to talk about but um, you know it's there's still controversy swirling around this little state that dominates the world news and anything that happens there uh, gets covered everywhere uh, so there's a lot of confusion uh, I say everything to do with Israel is a little bit complicated but it's, uh, it, it's a uh, most amazing, miraculous uh, thing. It really is God's time clock, as some people would say. And people, we're living in a, in a very uh, interesting time in history. And so how do you feel Canada's relationship with Israel right now is? We're here at the tail end of 2019, going into 2020. Well, we've had a very strong relationship with Israel. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the challenging times, and I don't think the current government has changed it a lot. You know, we're still supporting Israel. But all over the world, anti-Semitism is breaking out. So the problem with Canada is, like other nations, it's not the government at this particular time. It's, it's elements within the population where anti-Semitism and this, you know, desecrating uh, Jewish graveyards or, or attacks on, uh, on individuals. Uh, and anti-Semitic events are happening around the world and throughout Europe. And it's a very disturbing dynamic. So uh, that is something that we ought to be concerned about because this little people being, uh, you know, what they suffered during the Holocaust, being isolated, uh, and it's a, it's a terrible dynamic that can't be explained in natural terms, the hatred for the Jews. They get blamed for a lot of things that uh, is really a double standard. Other people are not held to the same level of accountability. Mm -hmm. Have you observed that dynamic here in Canada yourself? Well, sure. Uh, you know, there's, there's been, uh, we've had a conference on anti-Semitism, a global conference, one in uh, 2008 in London, England, and one in 2010 here in Ottawa, in Canada and Ottawa. Uh, and, uh, you know, the depictions of what was happening uh, in Canada and around the world were all highlighted there because parliamentarians around the world are concerned about it. Mm. And that dynamic is, is still at play. Mm, wow. And so while you were an elected official, what were, what were some of the things that, that you did as an elected official to encourage, uh, you know, fighting, combating anti-Semitism, et cetera? Well, I think uh, we need to call it out when we, when we see it. And, um, and I think, you know, the, the new trend today is beyond even the individuals uh, that are being attacked because they're wearing a kippah uh, or, uh, you know, uh, thrown off a boat like the Achille Loro. Uh, a Jewish man, uh, it was a ship in, um, in, out of Egypt that, uh, you know, people threw him off the ship in a man in a wheelchair. You know, these incidents uh, have been happening around the world. But as a me as individual, I think, is uh, participating really in these fora to help people understand that, um, you know, this is just not acceptable. And uh, demonizing these people is simply not acceptable. It never ends well when we demonize people and, and uh, dehumanize them. 
we, we hold people to uh, an account that we don't. Other, you know, uh, mass murderers in the world and the Assad regime. I mean, I don't know what the count in Syria was well over a quarter million when sort of lost count with the Arab Spring thing and where Syria ended up. But the geopolitical situation for Israel around the world is very serious right now with Iran uh, threatening to destroy Israel and increasingly working with partners to surround Israel with missiles and technology mm -hmm. that Israel has been fending off quietly. But it's a very unstable world and that uh, probably we can talk about that a little more as, as we go on here. For sure. Now, you use the word demonization. Why is Israel so demonized? What's your take on that? What's fueling this? Well, I think one of the things is Israel's been such a success, uh, you know, and they always are. And whenever economies fail anywhere in the world, it seems the Jewish people always get blamed. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we had terrible uh, history of anti-Semitism historically that Canada's on a journey of repentance related to that and calling it out. And we had uh, the ship that we sent back, the St. Louis. But uh, Canada's immigration minister of the day said none is too many mm -hmm. at the time because Jews were... Uh, Canada accepted, was going to accept agricultural experts from Europe, knowing full well there weren't any. There were never big landowners. This was in the 30s. In the 30s, because right. land was not portable. So they were, you know, had businesses that were money changers, and they had um, business like sewing and things that they could move when they had to because of persecution. Mm. But these things, these dynamics are still afoot in the world, and I think it's because they're successful, and I think God gave them survival. Uh, we can talk about the startup nation and all of the, the uh, Nobel Prizes and the technology and the mathematics and the chemistry hmm. and new drugs and technology come out of Israel and the, you know, the Intel uh, chip and the, um, the you know, the, the uh, USB um, sticks that we use all come out of Israel mm -hmm. uh, along with agricultural technologies for arid lands and so on. It's amazing the technologies come out of that little land. Yeah, and so the discrimination and the racism is um, perplexing in light of the contributions. I can see that. It's way beyond any other people mm -hmm. in that regard. Now, in a moment here, we're going to actually show a clip that illustrates just that of the resolutions regarding the resolutions at the United Nations against Israel. I'd love to get your thoughts uh, on the whole temperature at the, at the UN, and we'll keep chatting. And we're going to get to that right after this. We need to stand against uh, racism wherever it exists. Protect people from being bullied. It's the smallest uh, little piece of land in, and it's a very complex neighborhood with a lot of hostile uh, neighbors. You can pray from anywhere in the world, but in Jerusalem, they like to say it's a local call. Through the Fate Teen Show, we're tackling issues influencing our nation's future, like freedom of conscience, racism, poverty, the debt, human trafficking, abortion, democracy, and much more. If you missed a show, you can watch anytime at Fateen.tv or on YouTube. We hope to see you there. We love Canada, and we want to see it strong for generations to come. That's why we do this show. We can't do it alone. We need your help. Unlike commercial TV, this program is 100% donor-funded. If you'd like to see more episodes produced on important issues for our nation, please consider signing up to be a monthly partner or giving a special gift today. Every gift makes a real difference, and all gifts are tax deductible. Together, we can build a better Canada for the future. Visit Fateen.tv or call 613-552-5572 to donate today. No matter how you feel about the United Nations, it's the one place on planet Earth where nations get together and attempt to speak with one voice. That's why their resolutions can make a big difference. So when people all around the world see that approximately 40% of the UN Human Rights Council resolutions were against just one country, most of us would assume that country must be a really bad place. Perhaps ruled by, oh, say, a genocidal dictator who kills his own people, or maybe a tyrant continually threatening to annihilate another country. But actually, the country that has been condemned more times than every repressive country on Earth combined is a democracy. The only viable democracy in the Middle East, Israel. And with these repeated resolutions against Israel, it's easy to see why so many in the international community perceive Israel as a major cause of world problems. But are all these resolutions really justified? Because whether or not you agree with how Israel is handling its many challenges, when you do a basic comparison, like the number of deaths Israel is responsible for with the number of condemnations they've received, and then make that same comparison with other countries, it paints a surprising picture of a possible double standard. What could explain the enormous imbalance? 
Quick history lesson. In 1975, Cuba needed to gather support in order to take down the biggest democratic superpower dominating the global schoolyard, the United States. Seeing how the UN was mostly controlled by the democratic superpowers, Cuba, along with other communist nations, finally found a way to even the playing field. Because it just so happened that, at the same time, a number of Muslim countries were looking for new creative ways to gang up on Israel. So the communists realized that by joining the Muslims' anti-Israel coalition, they could create an unstoppable voting bloc inside the UN. Because with every resolution they passed against Israel, they simultaneously discredited Israel's ally, the United States. So in 1975, the newfound communist Muslim voting bloc spearheaded the passing of a UN resolution that officially stated, Zionism is a form of racism. Yes, Zionism. The movement trying to find ways to protect Jews from racism was redefined as racism. Which is kind of like saying the civil rights movement is racism and Martin Luther King is a racist. This is why resolution after resolution after resolution against Israel from 1975 until this day easily passes through the UN. But today, this movement has a new tool for attacking Israel as the cause of all our problems. The UN's Durban Review Conference on Racism. Durban is charged with finding the real root of racism, and at the last conference, keynote speaker and human rights best friend Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, yeah, the guy who openly called for Israel's annihilation, revealed that Zionism is not only racist, but the true root of racism throughout the world. And what has history taught us about what tends to happen when one ethnic group is believed to be the hidden root to all the world's problems? What is happening at Durban is catastrophic, not only for Jews, but for the whole world. And it's growing, spreading, and gaining credibility through Durban. Let's learn from history and this time act before false accusations lead to violence. Expose this threat and confront this lie before it once again takes hold of half the world. In another attack on Jewish people worldwide, anti-Israeli groups on university campuses today are marking the beginning of what they have dubbed infamously Israel Apartheid Week. They must not have a clear understanding of apartheid itself. Yeah. Unlike blacks in apartheid South Africa, Arab citizens of Israel have full political rights. They vote and participate in the political process. Arab Knesset representatives cross the spectrum from communist and Arab nationalist parties through to Likud. Salim Gibran, an Israeli Arab, is a judge on Israel's Supreme Court. Acts of ignorance such as these protests should offend not only all Canadians, but Parliament as well. Why? Well, Mr. Speaker, because an NDP student union is a co-sponsor. No. The very notion of a political party's connection to this brings shame to this yeah. chamber. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I implore both the NDP and misguided campus groups everywhere to stand down from this week-long attack. Well, Dr. Lenny, thank you for being a voice for this uh, in Parliament when you were there. Uh, so let's be a voice right now. Let's talk about um, what's happening at the UN, this whole thing about apartheid. Unpack that a little bit for us. Well, you know, the whole slur of uh, relating apartheid to Israel, uh, maybe some of the younger people have forgotten where apartheid came from. That was really appended to South Africa from another era uh, when, you know, there was, uh, the black people were just shut out of everything. They had no rights uh, that other people had. Now that's been remedied and, you know, they're going through their own challenges there now. But for Israel, uh, I just say, in my, in my time with the uh, Knesset Christian Allies Caucus International, we had a bunch of parliamentarians internationally coming together to talk about issues related to Israel. And one of the fellows was from uh, South Africa, uh, uh, Kenneth Meshue, is the leader of a party there. Uh, Kenneth is from the black community. And uh, Kenneth uh, uh, Meshue, when he talks about apartheid, he says, you tell me anything that you say is apartheid about the state of Israel, and I'll explain to you why it isn't. Mm. And he started a movement to bring, I uh, was trying to raise up 25 young black Africans to carry the message around the world. Uh, he started an organization called DAISY, Defend, uh, Advocate for, Intercede for, and Support Israel. Mm. Uh, because these young people uh, know what apartheid was really like. And when Israel, for example, in the election that just took place, uh, and they're trying to resolve, we want to talk a bit about that in terms of the stability of the state right now, but um, there were 13 Arab members elected, the highest number ever. Israel has 120 seats in the Knesset, and usually you'd have three or four uh, uh, Arabs uh, elected to represent the population. Uh, and, uh, you know, if that's their choice to vote for somebody from their own demographic, they have three or four, and... Uh, 
this time 13 Arab members were elected uh, on their own uh, block that they formed. That's more than 10% of the entire seats in Israel. There are judges in Israel that are Arab. Uh, and they fully participate. They have passports like everybody else, and they're Israeli citizens. And now Israeli Arabs are wanting to defend their country as well, and many of them are training with the IDF to protect their own nation. So, you know, it's, that's not a sign of apartheid, anything but. And these young people, sadly, on campus are just misinformed, misled, and following a, a strategy that is not based on reality and is counterproductive in carrying on anti-Semitism to another generation of people when we should be working to expunge it. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so we've just elected a new parliament here in Canada. What would your admonition be to our, our new elected members of parliament in light of some of these dynamics? Well, I mean, uh, you, they need to be informed. Uh, when In my term, we had 100 members of the two parliaments, the, the Senate and the House of Commons, that were members of the Canada-Israel Interparliamentary Friendship Group. And, uh, you know, members that have an interest in the Middle East and what's going on there and want to be informed, that's a good place to be informed. It's a voluntary association. And, uh, like I said, we had one of the largest um, uh, friendship groups in the, the, the Parliament. So I'm hoping that that will continue in the new Parliament and will do very well uh, in helping to make sure that people get, understand the real facts in an area that's complex mm -hmm. and where there's a lot of misinformation. Wow. Now let's talk about healing this um, divide in our own nation, you know, the, the tensions between the different people groups involved. Uh, what would be your admonition to the average Canadian out there that maybe sees an anti-Semitic act or uh, maybe in a university tutorial group, uh, you know, observes some uh, tensions between different, different people? Um, what would be your admonition to the average Canadian? Well, we need to... Um we need to stand against uh, racism wherever it exists and, and just uh, not, uh, protect people from being bullied. Uh, you know, a, a collective response, an individual response can make a huge difference. And, uh, and, and you know, uh, we need to actually know what the facts are so we can articulate them. And it's worth the price to be informed. It's the smallest uh, little piece of land in, in the world, really, for a nation. It's not a big nation. Uh, I think if all of the land were Israel, it would be 32,000 square kilometers if you, you had it all from the Jordan. to And Vancouver Island, my riding was 28,000 square kilometers. So it's not a huge piece of land. And it's a very complex neighborhood uh, with a lot of hostile uh, neighbors. And that perhaps is a segue into some of the uh, geopolitical situations going on right now. Hmm. Now, in the remaining moments that we have here, we're coming to a close with this show, but you know, there's that scripture that talks about praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. You know, any, any thoughts on that, the importance of prayer? Well, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, we know we can pray from anywhere in the world, but in Jerusalem, they like to say it's a local call. <laughs> uh, so, no, there's a, there's a, the second part of that, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, comes with an admonition uh, that uh, they will prosper, that bless thee. And people are attracting blessing or cursing, depending on how they react to this little nation. I actually believe that's a real dynamic. Governments uh, will attract blessing or cursing, depending on how they relate to this little people. It's not that they do everything right. It's that there's a purpose for this little nation. And um, certainly from a Christian's perspective, we need to stand with them. And uh, because there is really only one God, in spite of uh, there are other opinions on that, but I'm convinced there's only one God. And if we want to, uh, if we want to re attract blessing, then we ought to be blessing ourselves. Wow. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we end this show with praying a blessing over Israel right here from Canada? Would you be willing to lead us in prayer for Israel? Well, sure. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you. There's no distance to you. And I hope that maybe uh, those in the viewing audience might join us in just agreeing that your purposes would come to pass for this little land that you would... We know that you care about all the people of the land. You care about justice issues. You care about righteousness. And we ask you to just move into these circumstances and help um, protect Israel. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, uh, he that watches Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. So may you watch over Israel, protect her from the missiles that surround her at this time, from the hostilities from Iran, from Hezbollah, from Hamas, uh, from the, uh, the weapons that are being formed and, and installations that Iran is trying to put into Iraq and Syria, help the Israeli Defense Forces, and help the, uh, the Arab people that are trying to work with Israel to build a cooperative future. Uh, and uh, for those who are trapped in the conflict uh, with the Palestinian people about their future, we pray that you'd help bring 
order and resolution to this conflict uh, for the sake of all of the people in the region. And we pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Lenny, for being with me today. Pleasure. Uh, has God told you anything about the future of Canada? If so, will it be similar to what will happen in the United States? Here's what he's told me. He says, as long as Canada continues to support Israel, the church will prosper and government will make wise choices. He said, but if it weakens its stands on the Jews in Israel, then it will descend into economic chaos. Quebec will secede in its rebellion, pestilence, earthquakes, and increased suicides will mount, religious repression will come, and multiple spouses will be legalized, and the forest will begin to disappear. So that's, that's what the, uh, the Lord told me. Stephen, that you are a great friend of Israel and the Jewish people. I'm not just saying that. I mean it deeply from the bottom of my heart, and I speak for all the people of Israel. You have shown great moral leadership. Harper then made history by becoming the first foreign dignitary in the history of Israel to be given the key to the Knesset. Then, moments later, another first. Stepping up to address the Israeli Knesset, Harper became the first Canadian Prime Minister to be given such an honor. His historic speech was unabashedly marked by moral clarity and staunch support for the sole democracy in the region. Canada supports Israel fundamentally because it is right to do so. Canada finds it deplorable that some in the international community still question the legitimacy of the existence of the State of Israel. I'm delighted to see uh, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, it's, uh, we've had a chance to speak on the telephone. Canada and Israel have had superb relations. Um, uh, there's a foundation there to make these uh, relations even stronger in very practical things uh, uh, that uh, are of interest to both our peoples, and I look forward to having that conversation with you. Now, I'm inviting you to Israel at your earliest opportunity. Indeed, it would be a, a pleasure to return to, uh, to Israel uh, when, uh, when it works out. Thank you so much for being with us today. You know, Canada is a great country, and I truly believe Canada will only get better as people with great values stay involved in these important conversations, and that's why we do this show. We want to build a better Canada for the future, and we're so grateful that every week we're hearing of the impact of these broadcasts and the impact that they're having, and we want to invite you to be a part of it. This show is 100% donor-supported, and that means we don't exist unless Canadians who care join with this vision. And so we we would be so humbled if you would consider joining the team by signing up to partner on a monthly basis or giving a special donation today. Every bit makes a huge difference. You can call 613-552-5572 or visit faithteen.tv today. God bless you and God bless Canada.